Hi y'all, Kudrina here. Today I'm going to be reviewing the book The Mermaid and Mrs. Hancock by Imogen Herms Goa. I picked this book up using the first book of the month credit last September, so it did take me a while to get to due to the dinner list, which I reviewed in my last video. However, it did not take this long to read as I found this more enjoyable. A quick bit about the book of the month club. It is a subscription book club where they pick out five books for you to choose from and you can select one or skip it for the month and save the credit for another month. It is $15 a month, including shipping. Additional books are $10 each. Not sponsored, but I will be rating book of the month and upcoming video sometime this year. I've also included my referral link below if you are interested in trying it. We both get a free book for signups, which helps me out because I have such a short list of books to read. Anyways, back to your regular scheduled program, The Mermaid and Mrs. Hancock. The cover looks like this, which is frankly adorable. This book itself is 484 pages and divided into three different parts. Before I get into the cast and the writing system, let's briefly talk about the setting. This book is set in the mid-1770s in London. And for those of you who aren't history buffs, there's a circuit of, quote, freak shows, unquote, at the time as entertainment in London. Think bearded ladies, strange happened people, and unicorn blood. These people and objects are often taken on tour around Europe, and many times these tours last well past their deaths, as corpses were presented in a macabre manner in coffee houses or on the streets. I mentioned this to explain the state of the mermaid and to give some historical insight as why this is normal for the time period. This story flips back and forth between several point of views. The two main point of views belong to a 45-year-old widower, Johan Han Hancock. He is a wistful Davenport merchant who, is lost, who has lost his wife and son, Henry, in childbirth two decades ago, and now lives with his maid, Bridget, and niece, Suki Lepard. Spinelessly, he lets his older sister, Hester, Suki's mother, bully him. The other main character is a former mistress of a duke, down on her luck, Angelica Niels. At 27 years old, she is aging out of favor and is in financial turmoil with her high spending after the death of her duke, who left her with nothing. Threatened to be forced back into Miss Chappelle's nunnery, which is basically a respectable cat house at the time. So yeah, if you haven't already guessed it by the title alone, love story. You got your ugly, naive old man and the aging femme fatale beauty. But where does the mermaid come in? So at the beginning of the story, Hancock is waiting for his ship to come back. It has been out to sea for two years at this point, so he fears the worst. Well, as Captain Tysoe shows up in a monkey paw fashion with his beautiful mermaid that he traded the ship for. Seriously, there's this dark and eerie night vibe that can only be described as a bad deal for buying this mythical animal paw that is going to curse us all. Anyway, the mermaid is not quite what you expect. The mermaid is a baby that is described with the monkey-like features and claws. This isn't a beautiful or magical it isn't even alive. Still, it thrills and fascinates people with his grotesque little monkey paws. Suffice to say, he does what anyone with a horde in these times does and takes it to his favorite coffee shop to be displayed. Anyone can now see it for chilling. Sick, right? And this is more or less how these two mismatched lovers are projected on their path of love and mutual understanding. Honestly, though, I did enjoy this book. The subtle historical concepts and the way the characters interact with each other made it fun period drama. While the plot was nothing revolutionary and obviously predictable to anybody but Angelica, the writing was vivid and interesting, and I could say I do recommend this book. However, I was a fair warning, while the goar is sufficient at show not tell, small details tend to escape her. The biggest offender is the old-fashioned English women's clothing. If you aren't a bit big on fashion or you don't know the names of the garments, may whatever de deity you worship help you. You will be very confused even in context. Same if you're American who has not been exposed to much to your English. There's really something to be said about taking time and explaining basic terms at least once, which would have been helpful here. But her biggest defense is the inability to wrap up a story into a nice little package. She has the end in mind, but doesn't so it quite seem to know how to get there. For example, one of the characters, Polly, leaves behind Miss Chappelle's and runs away towards the end of the second third. Well, her last real point of view scene is her, her on the streets trying to survive before she decides to go find friends of Miss Chappelle's footman recommends. This is it. Minus one little sentence cameo at the end of the book. Like, why bring it up at all? It's bizarre. Same with another character, Mrs. Frost. She starts out, out as Angelica's friend and confidant she, and turns to, into a bod herself using Angelica's own money. She is invited towards the party at the end, but is never mentioned at said party, except for one offline about different par parts of society being brought together. Even the two main characters don't really get a resolved ending. Sure, they are happy and content, but they don't really address a lot of baggage that they have, like what's up with, spoiler, the living mermaid, or Angelica's miscarriage and how it will affect them and trying for kids in the future. It really ends like a Christmas special ending of Gossip Girl. 
where they are propelled into the future five years later and everything is fine as Serena and Dan get married, putting aside their long torrent path. Oh, and look, there's people who we have in two seasons making a cameo and are supposed to be eating their just desserts for being horrible humans. Again, it's bizarre. My only explanation is one of three things. She feared she was making the book too long and was under pressure to finish it and tie up loose ends. Or B, she wants to make this into a movie where it's, this thing is okay and it's okay to have these complex endings with not much love at the end. Or C, leaving it open for the sequel. In which case, get a climax, please. Because Angelica finding Hancock staring at a vat of mermaid. Or Suki going crazy for half a minute while not addressing her mental state afterwards is in the very last chapter is really not it. Anyways, the first two thirds of this book were enjoyable if you don't expect anything past a good old fashioned modern written love story about two people slowly growing in love in the 1700s. I think it was a decent read and can recommend it despite my reservations towards the end. That's all for this time. I will be back with my next review, The Clockmaker's Daughter. But before then, I'll probably review my own writing. See you soon.